to my right, Dr. Levitt, who founded this group 32 years ago and has for 39 years continued his quest for better hearing health care in this community and throughout the country. Um, Russ Brand, he is a longtime hearing aid wearer and a product tester uh, for our group. And then to his right is Nikki Clark, who is the Director of Operations at the Corvallis Hearing Center and herself a lifelong hearing aid uh, user. Uh, she's presented at international conferences throughout this country and published in a lot of international journals. So that is the group today. Um, now that we've gotten that taken care of, let's get down to the business of determining uh, what provides a normal hearing with hearing aids, as well as the hearing aid buying guide that you guys all should have today. I thought that was rather, this slide here is a rather dry presentation of it, so I thought I'd just give you a little timeline with the key players. And it starts off in 19... 1993 when the FDA commissioner David Kessler was sitting home watching TV and he heard a Miracle Ear advertisement on TV that said their hearing aids could take the speech you wanted and get rid of all the noise that you didn't want. And he thought to himself, sitting there in the middle of the night watching TV, that doesn't make any sense. And then he thought, but wait, I'm FDA commissioner. I'm supposed to be overseeing these devices because they're medical devices. They're class two medical devices. I oversee these so I can do something about it and something he did. Uh, two years later, the Federal Trade Commission fined Miracle Ear millions of dollars for false advertising because under type 2 devices by the FDA, you have to tell how you make your statements. You have to show your evidence. You have to show the subjects that were run. You have to show the outcomes that were provided. And they had none. So he said, okay, fine. Then you're in violation of the Federal Trade Commission dictates on this. So hearing aid manufacturers were not particularly happy because they were making some incredible statements about what hearing aids could do, none of which were true. They knew they weren't true. And they knew they were all going to be subject to these multi million dollar fines if they didn't do something. So what they did was kind of clever. Uh, two years later, they got the FDA, first they got David Kessler out, not just the hearing aid industry, but a variety of groups wanted him gone. And they found an FDA commissioner who was willing to declassify hearing aids to type 1 devices. Type 1 medical devices under FDA don't have to show any proof of anything. You can say anything you want with virtually no implications. And what so. other things are in, F, uh, in the type 1 devices? Oh, you've got your tongue depressors, you've got your non-motorized wheelchairs, you've got crutches, you've got canes, things like that. Things that people think, well, th you know, that's pretty straightforward. You should be able to buy those at a five and dime. <laughs> this group is older, they know what a five and dime is. <laughs> You've never heard of that, right? <laughs> Every day she gives me that look. It's called the dollar store now. <laughs> it's called the dollar store now, that's right. But, but still, it's, it hasn't gone up much in that much time. So, yeah, then... Uh, people in the hearing aid industry said, oh, this is a great victory for us. We are unfettered now to do most whatever we want. And in fact, I went to a presentation back about this time in 97, where one of the FDA people said, uh, it would be hard to envision how we would ever step in on anything related to hearing aids anymore. So the, the field was wide open. The hearing aid manufacturers were thrilled. But see, sometimes, uh, as Freud had pointed out, the things you want most of the things you fear most. And they didn't know it at the time, but they opened up a can of worms when they did this because going down to a type 1 device made it seem like hearing aids weren't that important. So then, back in 2009, uh, Food and Drug Administration said, you know, why don't we just have a separate class of these things you can buy online? We'll call them personal sound amplifying products. And you can just get them anywhere. No testing, no medical oversight, no no, nothing, because after all, these are just class one devices in the first place, even if they were full-blown hearing aids. So the beat goes on. 2009, personal sound amplifiers come into existence. And then about in 2012, a man by the name of Frank Lynn started looking into the relationship between hearing loss and a variety of other medical conditions. Comorbidity, he called it. And 
after a four year period, he convinced the group that advises Medicare that they should publish a document saying that among other things, uh, you don't really need any medical oversight if you have a hearing problem because it's a fairly rare condition. And two, uh, we should probably create a bunch of hearing aids that you can buy over the counter at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, 7-Eleven, Walmart, wherever you want to go. Uh, and so in 2015, uh, this national, 16, excuse me, this National Academy Academy of Engineering, Science, and Medicine, which is the group that advises Medicare, came out with this document, Hearing Health Care for Adults, Improving Priorities for Affordability and Access to Hearing Health Care. And in this book, they said, you know, what we really need is some research looking into this buy it yourself without any medical oversight idea. And we should take a look and see if we have any proof whatsoever that over the counter hearing aids might be a good idea. Well, they also said, we also want the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders and the Veterans Administration to make money available to do research in how well you folks out there can self-treat, self-diagnose your own hearing problems and buy your own hearing aids over the counter and take a look at how that turns out for you. Well, because there were millions of dollars available, not surprisingly, people stepped up to this, which is our next slide. Two of them, my old colleague from Indiana University, Dr. Larry Humes, and uh, Frank Lynn from Johns Hopkins Medical University, the guy that came up with these ideas in the first place, really. Uh, well, not in the first place. There were others who had suggested it, but nobody of the stature of Frank Lynn that uh, got the country's attention. So they stepped up and they looked into this uh, money available for research. And in 2017, both of them published articles saying this is probably a pretty good idea because, after all, it was Franklin's idea in the first place, so you would expect his research would show this is a good idea. Self treatment, self diagnosis of hearing problems, good idea. Then, August 2017, this over the counter hearing aid bill was signed into law, August 18th, 2017. So now it's the law of the land. Now they're still arguing about the specific details. Details, but basically it's law now and it's just uh, now up to Congress and the Federal Register and concerned experts to put data into this uh, discussion to determine what they want to do to really make it work well. So that's where we are. 2018, any discussion of Medicare ever paying for hearing aids is off the table. So that brings you up to the present. And, like I, yes, go ahead. and if you were at our meetings about what, three to five years ago, we were talking about how Medicare was actually meeting together to do something about hearing loss and about providing hearing aids uh, through Medicare. Um, and now that the current events have happened, uh, they are most likely going to cease to doing exist. anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Why do you suppose no consumer groups uh, jumped in and said, hey, this is a dumb idea, that's strange. That's a, that's a great. His his question was, why didn't any consumer yeah, groups it. jump in? And the answer is, they did, but they didn't say it was a dumb idea. The Hearing Loss <laughs> Association of America says it's the greatest thing we've ever heard. Yeah. Because the idea is this: it's going to save you money. These things that these guys are wearing are expensive, and it's going to save you hundreds of, if not thousands, of dollars. And therein lies the current state of the art. But we're going to have something to say about that too, as you might well guess. But that gives you a brief history of how we got here from 1992 to the present and why Medicare is not in the foreseeable future going to be paying for your hearing aids. Second, health-related research. And this sort of flies in the face of uh, what you might expect Franklin would be doing because he was the one that really got the idea for self-treatment, self-diagnosis of hearing problems and over-the-counter hearing aids, yet his research is uh, sort of argues against it. And we're going to take a look at that first. 
he found that hearing loss is associated, and this is on page third, I gave away all my books. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> You'll see a little chart here, oh, there you go, page 16, that shows all the conditions that have been associated with hearing loss. And the ones that get the most attention are dementia. Uh, people with mild hearing losses have twice as likelihood of getting all incident dementia as others who don't have hearing loss and are equally matched on all the risk factors. Why people is that, Ron? Uh, we'll get to that because that's part C here. Lynn is part A, but part C is, is the answer. Uh, and Let's see, so yes, the cognitive problems were the, have gotten the most attention internationally in the news. But he also showed you're three times as likely to fall down if you have a hearing problem. And falling down is the number one cause of accidental death in people over age 65. So that's important. He also found that the incidence of depression is much higher in people who are hearing impaired. And I believe that has some to do with isolation produced by the hearing loss and poor or hearing aid function. But you can see there, it doesn't stop there. Mortality is highly related to uh, the degree of hearing loss you have, and for a variety of reasons. Are there any chairs left? Uh, yeah, maybe so. Oh, yeah, there's one over there, too. Good. Yes, there is. <laughs> That's right. You're, no, no, you're good. Uh -huh. Did they look into... Um, how children are affected in their education. They did. I mean, it's not just about us old folks. No. So he was saying, do they look into the, the pediatric population, what it does to them in terms of education? You know, Nikki here, by the way, was a lifelong hearing aid wearer. She was, had hearing aids when she was a baby. Uh, so anyway, First, he comes out with information about all these serious health conditions associated with hearing loss, but then he says, so let's stop doing any medical oversight and go to over-the-counter hearing aids. And this article is where they finally published their results in 2017 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, showing that on the next slide. This is a pretty good idea. Conclusion of this research showed you could buy hearing aids online that were just as good as state-of-the-art hearing aids like what these guys are wearing. Specifically, select personal sound amplifying products. Uh, and then I can't see it. I need a taller. <laughs> I'll turn around. We need booster seats. <laughs> yes. Personal sound amplifying products are associated with improvements in speech understanding for individuals with hearing loss that were similar to results obtained with specifically an Oticon Nera hearing aid. Oticon being one of the big six manufacturers of hearing aids. So they're just as good. And so you say, that's great. Which personal sound amplifiers are we talking about? Well, he listed them for us. There were three. The Sound World Solutions CS50, which I didn't think people would wear. It's too big and cumbersome. But the other two are possible. So we looked at them. The Sound Hawk and the uh, Edemotic Bean. And here's what we found. Uh, there's a picture of the Sound Hawk on the left and the Edemotic Bean on the right. They're basically in the $400 price range, so people like that, and they can order them directly online until, of course, the company on the left, the Sound Hawk, went out of business. Curious. But anyway, uh, we bought them, and we got a bunch of people together, and we tested them with these devices. And come to find out, they didn't do as well with these devices as what Franklin and his his folks said they would do. You see, Franklin said that people with mild to moderate hearing loss with those two devices did just as well as they do with a state-of-the-art hearing aid. Okay, great. So we got a state-of-the-art hearing aid. We rounded up six people who had moderate hearing losses, and we programmed the hearing aids, and we'll talk about how we did that in a bit, to exactly the same level that, of their hearing loss. And come to find out, they do a lot better when you do that than if you just buy something off the, off the shelf. Uh, think of these numbers here, these little green dots as the number of errors that they did when they were trying to listen to speech and noise. And you can see there are very few errors were made with the best practices, the AB, the audiology best practices. But by contrast, the Edemotic Bean and the Soundhawk, they made huge errors. In fact, they could hardly repeat any of the words at all. 
and I'm very severely hard of hearing. I just for fun put it in my ear and I'm like, this thing on, I could hear like whispers, but it, it was hardly doing anything. And some of the moderate hearing loss uh, patients that we had try this said the same thing. It's just way too weak. And we had it set to the highest level. So we couldn't replicate this study. The average rate of speech understanding error, in fact, was 500% greater with these two devices than with a hearing aid properly programmed to your hearing loss. So along came Humes, and he said, well, this idea that consumers can decide needs testing. So he got, uh, concluded that hearing aids were effective in older adults for both the audiology best practices and the consumer decides delivery model. And in fact, the speech understanding scores and outcomes were pretty much equal between the two. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and he said, uh, he gave specific details, unlike Frank Lynn and his group, as to how he did it. So we could, it was easy to replicate this. Uh, now, because he's evaluating a consumer decision model, you would think then that he had you all go out and buy a hearing aid online, and then put it on your ear and kind of get used to it, and then come into the clinic and he'd do some testing to see how well you understood speech. Well, that's not what happened at all. That's not how he did a consumer decision. Instead, he he did something quite different. Uh, for the best practices and the consumer decides group, they all got complete medical evaluations. They all got cognitive screening to make sure there were no mental problems. They also got comprehensive hearing tests by audiologists at Indiana University who set the default program of the hearing aids, the state-of-the-art hearing aids they used, not over the counter, uh, to exactly match the individual's hearing loss. But, next slide, the CD group had extensive medical, cognitive, hearing evaluations and received pre-programmed state-of-the-art hearing aids. Then what? Well, the thing they actually got to decide was what color they wanted and the tip that goes on the end that goes in their ear. That's the essence of this consumer decision model that he was talking about. So, next slide, that's what consumer decision means. Next, and this is what passes for the consumer decision model in our profession. And here's the part that really surprises me. He presented this, and he's been interviewed in numerous professional audiology journals, and the usual thing they start off with is, this is a wonderful study. Thank you for showing us this. But my problem is, uh, I tried to replicate it doing exactly what he did with exactly the same hearing aids. And he was very specific, so it was easy to, to replicate this. When we tried to replicate it, we got a very different outcome, which is on the next slide. Again, you see the errors with the consumer decision model as opposed to the best programming model. There's no relationship for these patients with moderate hearing losses between his idea of pre-programmed hearing aids and one size fits all, if you will, and actual programming to your hearing loss. You just cannot function as well by a wild guess. This, by the way, this was tried in 1942 by Hallowell Davis at the Harvard uh, Psychoacoustics Laboratory, and it didn't work any better then than it did now, so this isn't really a new idea. So, the group at Johns Hopkins, that's the Frank Lynn group, and Indiana University, Humes and all, lend credence to self-diagnosis and self-treatment of hearing and balance problems, but we can't replicate these findings in the least. But what about all those health-related factors associated with hearing loss? Well, what indeed? But here's what people said when you start asking those questions. Noted physicians say these problems happen so rarely they are of little consequence. Franklin was one of them. So <laughs> makes you wonder what he does for his job. But okay, because he's an ear surgeon, but he said that ear surgery is very rarely needed. And then if you look at this gentleman, Dr. Mann from the FDA Department of Ear, Nose, and Throat, he's in that group, he said that there's, they conducted extensive research when they drafted this 
National Academies of Engineering, Science, Medicine document. And he said, we found that it happens so rarely. These causes of hearing loss requiring urgent attention are rare. And when they do occur, you probably could figure it out on your own because you've got pus coming out of your ear or blood or some major problem. So you might ask, well, uh, are you an ear specialist? No, he's an ophthalmologist. But okay, whatever, <laughs> moving on. So we looked at the next 50 patients that came into our clinic, Ashley and I, and we just counted what they had. And about half of them had one of several things. It, you know, if I just, all I have to do right, to replicate this study is look at every day we see people. Yesterday we saw a person with a hole in their eardrum. You didn't see that because you were in the other room, but uh, Vicki brought her to me. Uh, we saw a person with uh, fluid behind the eardrum. We saw a person with a 100% plug of earwax. We saw people who had a variety of hearing and balance problems, who, by the way, went to Miracle Ear and had a very serious ear disease that they just put a hearing aid over the top of. So uh, we don't think that this is a good idea. And I can prove it with data. Next. So what are the implications of these findings? Well, we can agree maybe self-diagnosis and self-treatment of hearing and balance problems isn't such a good idea. By the way, one of those patients of the 50, one of them died of a tumor in the ear. Because uh, she started off at Costco. And they put hearing aids on and let years go by, and that was that. Despite the findings of this distinguished group at the National Academies of Engineering, Science, and Medicine, the Medical Advisory Board, and you can see there are people there from Mayo Clinic, there are people there from the Audiology Division, there are people from my old alma mater at University of Arizona Medical School, there are people there from Johns Hopkins, there are people there from, uh, oh boy, I can't, one of the prestigious medical schools. Uh, so it was a distinguished group, and interesting. Interestingly, they all had to sign something saying they would not say anything dissenting after this agreement was reached. They're all, it's because it's a group consensus statement. So not only can we not replicate these findings, but our next researchers show there's more to hearing aids than, than just making you hear better. It's actually helping your brain. And this study is very important. And she's published about six papers now on this. Her name is Anu Sharma. And she also works with a group of researchers at University of Colorado Boulder. And let's take a look at her findings because these are very important. She made brain recordings of people who had normal hearing and who had hearing loss. She noted that the brains of adults with mild early onset hearing loss were different than those of people who were similarly matched but had hearing loss for just as long as three months. Mild hearing losses for just three months. And they started noticing differences between the normal hearing and hard of hearing in the auditory area of the brain. So that's the area there. It's called the temporal lobe, and that's where we, our brain makes sense of the sounds we hear, particularly speech understanding. And you would expect then, when a person is doing an auditory task, that they would then be using the auditory area of the brain. And that's exactly what happens with people who have normal hearing. When you're doing an auditory task, you use the auditory area of the brain. And there's the functional MRI that shows it. Next slide. That's not what happens with people that have hearing loss. They're using the frontal area of the brain to hear. Well, what does the frontal area of the brain do, you might ask? Well, that's where your memory is. So they're using the frontal and prefrontal area of the brain for listening. And that is the memory and reasoning area of the brain. You're using the very area of the brain that goes haywire when you have dementia. So, hard of hearing people are misusing the frontal area of the brain when listening to speech. They're using the memory and reasoning area for speech understanding. 
And Dr. Lin told us that hearing loss increases the risk of memory loss and poor reasoning abilities, aka dementia. Could it be that hearing loss keeps the reasoning and memory areas of the brain too busy to perform their appropriate functions? And reasoning. And that could explain why hearing loss increases the risk of dementia. So let's look at normal brain and brains with dementia. Where does it affect you? In the frontal area. Next. So Dr. Lin's overwork hypothesis that he stated back in 2012 when he started publishing this stuff, that we were overworking the brain inappropriately, now has proof. And it's not just the auditory and area and the reasoning areas of the brain that are being affected by your hearing loss. You're scrambling everything everywhere in improperly treated hearing loss. Let's look at the next one. It's also the visual area. In the visual area, when you're doing a visual task, like if you see a whole bunch of geometric figures and they say what, which two are similar, you know, like maybe they had five sides each or something, you're using the visual area to make those determinations. And that's how where, how, where that should happen is back in the back of your brain in what's called the occipital lobe. And that's exactly what happens when you show normal hearing people a visual task that they have to do. They light up the visual area in a functional MRI. All makes sense. But that's not what happens with people who have hearing loss. You're using the auditory area. It's, I mean, every part of the brain is moving around in ways that don't make sense. People with hearing loss are borrowing auditory area to do visual tasks. We're, so, we're trying to lip breathe a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly what. And I didn't mention it, but you're also using the somatosensory area. And, and Dr. Sharma was confused about why that was, but both uh, Nikki and my other assistant, Colette, who are lifelong hearing aid wearers, said, I think I can tell you why that is. When we're trying to lip read, we're sort of, in our mind, thinking about where was that tongue placed when I heard that word that I missed? Was that a T? Was that a B? Was that a P, what that, and so they're using, they're, they're going back to their tactile area, their touch feeling area to determine where would that have been to produce that sound. So it's not just the visual, it's not just the auditory, it's not just the memory and reasoning area, but even the touch sensitive area, the somatosensory as they call it area is being scrambled when you have. So we conclude that this brain reorganization is taking place all over the brain for people, even with mild hearing loss. But here's some really good news. People who can score well on a something called the quick speech and noise test seem to be spared this reorganization. So that brings up the question of What is this quick speech and noise test? How do you score normally on it? Well, I got some answers to that one too. We took a look some time ago at, uh, I see Sylvia's here, she was one of the subjects, at people who uh, were trying out state-of-the-art hearing aids at the time. We bought the most expensive, the, the 900 level, we were talking about this earlier, what does the 500, 700, 900 levels mean? We bought the 900 level of hearing aids from every major manufacturer. That's Oticon, Phonak, Resound, Siemens, Starkey, and Widex. Siemens now calls themselves uh, Signia, but still Siemens. Uh, and we had them programmed the way most people do. And the way most people in this state, and people tell me internationally, uh, program hearing aids is they type in the amount of hearing loss you have and then tell the computer, make your best guess as to what that hearing aid should do on this person's ear. And when we do that, we found, this is back to this air study again, the smaller the numbers, the, the, the fewer the errors. So when you use the computer to program the hearing aid with no input from the individuals, by the way, uh, Russ here, I asked him to be on this panel today because back about 22 years ago, you may not even remember this, Russ, remember. <laughs> Russ came to me and said, uh, you know, I've got been wearing hearing aids for a lot of years, and, and I keep thinking that there must be some way you can take these hearing aids, put them on my ears, and see what they're doing when I'm wearing them. And I said, that's brilliant. It's called real ear measurement. And we, we got started 22 years ago that very way. And come to find out, real ear measurement showed his hearing aids weren't programmed 
program properly. So what we did though is we didn't do that. We did what everybody else does. We put the, virtually everybody else, uh, we put the data of his hearing loss into the computer and let the computer decide. And here are the air levels for that type of fitting. You can see the bars are fairly long, quite a few airs for all the six major manufacturers from the most expensive hearing aids in the world at the time. Now just for fun, I took also two very old hearing aids that had no features whatsoever except for programming ability and programmed them exactly to the individual's hearing loss. And you'll see that's what the old is. It was better than all of the newest, most expensive hearing aids on the market. So it started me thinking, gosh, I think it's the programming that I'm doing, not the uh, hearing aid itself, not the features, not the cost, none of that. So, but I thought, you know, I wonder if I program these hearing aids properly using this real ear system that Russ had, and I were talking about, maybe I can get a better result and come to find out I could. The pink or whatever color you want to call that shows the improvement rate. The air message, the airs now are much shorter. In fact, almost all of them did better than the old 20 year old hearing aids with no features whatsoever. Which I hope so. You're buying a new hearing hearing aid, it should outperform a 20-year-old hearing aid. And you would think then, after manufacturers saw this data, they'd say, oh, well, my goodness, then everybody's going to have to do this real ear measurement because they're not going to get their money's worth out of our hearing aids. But that's not really how the hearing aid industry thinks. The hearing aid industry, I believe, and I've never sat in on one of the board meetings, but I think they think that if you just show a lot of them, the number of people who will actually reject a bad fitting are virtually non-existent. Would you say that's true, given how many bad fittings you've seen in two years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's a good sales t technique because really it's quick, you know, you just type in the hearing loss and put the hearing aid on Russ and out the door he goes. And unless he complains, and Russ is one of the unusual ones because he does come back and say, you know, I think we could do something better. Uh, You've got a hearing aid sale, and a lot of them. Uh, in fact, we'll show data here in a minute that shows that about 97.8% of the hearing aids programmed in this state in the last year at 24 different facilities, looking at 173 different hearing aids, were bore virtually no resemblance to the individual's, individual's hearing loss. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But she was there to help me gather the data. Uh, so uh, it's programming, my friends. Next slide. We learned from Sharma that for the brain to relocate everything takes three months. Do you guys know what the average weight is for you for a person to go in for a hearing test and deal with their hearing loss? Do you know what the average is? 10 years. People are waiting 10 years uh, before they actually do anything about their hearing loss or get a hearing aid. So it's interesting. Well, I think that's <laughs> partly because people that start suffering the, the loss of the hearing don't, you don't realize it because you're used to hearing what you're hearing every day. So. Well, that and uh, you don't know what you're missing. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Which brings us to our manufacturer's buying frenzy. Three companies pretty much own the whole game now. Sonova, William DeMont, and uh, then uh, the... Uh, the big six. Yes, uh, I'm trying to think of the GN... Odomet not Odometrics, Great Nordic uh, Investments or own about the rest of them. Uh, so there's the holdings of uh, William DeMont and Sonova, and Great Nordic uh, owns pretty much all the rest of it. So you really got three companies that are controlling everything out there, hearing aid wise and cochlear implant wise. But after the dust cleared, there were really six still standing. Oticon, Phonak, Resound, Siemens, all now Signia, Starkey, and Widex. But what about all these others, you might ask? What about Belltone? What about Miracle Ear? And what about Costco? Well, they buy, or they're owned by, one of those six people. So really, when you buy any of those hearing aids, you're just buying a, another 
down hand-me-down version they never give virtually never give them the state-of-the-art version a hand-me-down version of the same things they were making a year or two ago and a lot of these companies like New Ear, Costco and Beltone lock their software so I cannot get in there and reprogram them to your hearing loss so if you have a bad program from one of those three I can't fix it and if one of those companies decided to run away and close down, uh, you're stuck with a hearing aid that can no longer be reprogrammed by anyone. And these hearing aids really need reprogramming. Here is a study of those 173 hearing aids at 24 facilities in this state that we looked at to see how close the programming corresponded to the individual's actual hearing loss. Had they been a perfect match to the individual's hearing loss, the red right ear and the blue left ear lines would be straight across at zero, meaning no air whatsoever. But what we discovered is they were getting progressively worse in the high pitches. And again, to replicate this study, I can do it every day. Yesterday, we had a guy come in who had hearing aids from someplace else. Ashley took a look at the real ear measures, and the unaided and aided results were... The exact same. So he was basically wearing earplugs um, more than a hearing aid. They conformed exactly to his hearing loss. He was getting no amplification. He was probably losing some hearing by wearing his hearing aids. So these hearing aids need reprogramming. Next. Because without proper programming, brain sparing does not occur. You have to score near normally on this quick speech and noise test for that to happen. And we've been looking with great interest at how people score normally on this quick speech and noise test. Which brings us to Robin Cox, the spoiler. This is where I'm going to save you $1,000 per hearing aid. She seems like a nice enough woman, but she questioned this idea that manufacturers have been touting for many years that yeah, if you're a person who's always in quiet, easy listening environments, you can buy our basic technology. But if you want to hear in noisy places, if you want to be functional in difficult, noisy environments like restaurants and at family gatherings, you got to go to the top of the pile, our most expensive hearing aids. And this has gone on for, well, I don't know, at least three, four decades that I've heard of this argument. Three decades, anyway. So she said, well, I'm not sure it's true. Prove it. So what she did, got 45 people together, average age of 70 years. They had this moderate hearing loss. Each participant used two pair, four pairs of hearing aids from two different manufacturers. She bought the most basic hearing aids and the most advanced hearing aids from two of these big six manufacturers we were discussing. If I had to guess, I bet she used uh, Phonak and Oticon, but she wouldn't tell me. Uh, and she programmed all of them to the, exactly the same level of correction using this real ear system that Russ thought up back 20 some odd years ago. And then she didn't tell them which was the basic hearing aids and which were the advanced hearing aids. She took off all the identifying marks and said, okay, what I want you to do is come to our clinic. I'm going to give a bunch of speech and noise tests to you, and I'm going to have you wear them out in your real world, and I want you to take a diary, and I want you to write down, well, with hearing aid A, I did like this. With hearing aid B, I did like this. With hearing aid C, I did like that. And with hearing aid D, I did like that. So she really looked at this question for months with all these people who are wearing these advanced and basic hearing aids. 45 and average age 70. She did formal speech testing and noise, formal hearing aid user surveys, and a daily diary of hearing aid experiences. Good for you, Robin. None of these measures yielded a statistically significant difference in outcomes between the premium and the basic hearing aids. So, she said, you know, I don't think it's the the model or the brand or the features. I think it's the programming. What a novel idea. We suggested that hearing aid programming was more important than the features, brand, or model. And that can save you a lot of money. Never buy the most advanced model. Nikki here has a choice of any hearing aid in the world she wants, but she does not wear the top premium level model. In fact, I can do just as well with the premium as I do with the basic. It, I perform the same on speech and noise test. That being said, um, 
the hearing aid does need to be powerful enough to correct your hearing loss. We're not going to recommend um, a very low level uh, hearing aid that isn't going to be powerful enough for you because sometimes you, if you have a more moderate to severe hearing loss, uh, it doesn't have the juice in it. And um, some brands are worse than others. Um, so, Which brings us to measuring your hearing loss. Uh, and there's a variety of ways it's done. Uh, let's take a look at the most conventional. That's the audiogram, the hearing test form. It shows how much hearing loss you have at the different pitches important for understanding speech. Uh, the circles are the right ear, the X's are the left. So this person has, as you can see, a progressively greater hearing loss into the high pitches. By the way, if you had perfectly normal hearing, it would be a straight line of zeros and X's right at zero. But you can see this person starts off pretty good in the low pitches and has more and more hearing loss in the high pitches. That's the conventional way of reporting uh, results. And then there's this conventional wisdom, which I don't think has much wisdom in it. The use of the terms normal, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe and profound. What in the world does that tell people? But this is, the, in fact, the state of Oregon, in its infinite wisdom, decided, the Hearing Aid Licensure Division, decided they were going to pass an Oregon administrative rule that we all had to use that terminology. And I wrote them and I said, this is a horrible idea. People around the country that really know stuff about audiology are going to think we're idiots if you do this. Because this was developed in 1980. Can you see the date of that publication by uh, Clark? 1983? 81. 81. You know, this, this idea, there's, there's newer books out there. This is a 37-year-old idea. And what he did, in fact, even his title suggests that people were misusing it even back then. But uh, if I tell you, Russ, that you've got a severe hearing loss, what does that really, if somebody asks you, so what sort of things can you hear and not hear? And you, and you say, well, I've got a severe hearing loss. And then they say, but what is a severe hearing loss? And you say, well, it's a severe hearing loss. But what does it mean that you can't hear? Uh, and therein sort of lies the problem with this classification system that the Oregon Administrative Rules required because it doesn't tell you anything. In fact, it doesn't only tell him, it tells him nothing. It doesn't tell speech pathologists who train side by side with audiologists anything. When you ask them what it means, they can't tell you either. Yeah, that's true. And what I, the way I've handled that, if, usually I do something to, along the line of a demonstration. I'll, I'll t tap on it and I'll say, well, without my hearing aid, I can't hear that. That's pretty bad. That's what that means. So wouldn't it be nice if there was some way that we could trash this idea of mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, profound, and, and actually give a number that would mean something to people? Well, we tried to suggest this to our national association. In fact, won an award uh, the year we published this, at, uh, presented it at our conference. Uh, and it's called the Speech Intelligibility Index, uh, or the count the dots method versus classification. And what what you do essentially is you take that same hearing loss and you look at how many, what percentage of speech sounds are still hearable. It gives you a number. Now, Ashley, you can imagine, doesn't have to count the dots on every one of these people. The guy that invented this means of doing it gave us the computer program, so we just pop your hearing loss in there and it comes back immediately. That's, you know, 40. Did you say this was 50%, by the way? 44%. 44%. And the 44% is speech sounds. So the speech intelligibility index is telling us how many speech sounds on that audiogram um, where the color is, is actually all the speech sounds uh, that you that you can hear. And so me with normal hearing, I'm straight across. I can hear all of those. But as you're hearing loss gets worse, you start losing um, some speech sounds, which is why you're having the problem when there's background noise, because you're not hearing them. Um, so when you come to our clinic and you have a hearing test and you're a new patient, or even if you're an old patient, you can ask me to give you one. I can give you an audiogram that shows your right ear and your left ear. Um, and above it, or above the lines are things that you're missing. And you can see that. Um, and it's just a easier way to understand your hearing loss than just telling you that you have a moderate or severe hearing loss. 
The third way of explaining it is to look at the speech sounds that are inaudible. It's sort of like count the dots, but it's less precise. But it's, it's meaningful, you know. This person can't hear P, H, G, C, H, S, H, T, S, H. So, you know, they're in trouble. They're missing a whole lot of speech sounds, and hopefully the hearing aid's making some of them hearable. But uh, it's not as quantifiable as the articulate. SII, it used to be called the Articulation Index, the Speech Intelligibility Index, because there you really got a number you can sink your teeth into. And it's easy to determine, especially with children, oh, your SII is 0.3, or 30%. We better start thinking about cochlear implants for you, because studies have shown that if you can't, once you hit 80 decibels in hearing loss, you have a four times better likelihood of a cochlear implant outcome than with a hearing aid. So, and as you start thinking about why this is, uh, when you get down towards the bottom of the page there and your, uh, in, your audibility index is 0%, uh, even with the best of hearing aids, we cannot bring you back to a 65% hearing level. So then cochlear implants, the surgery that puts wires in place and gives you back a whole bunch more hearing, uh, makes, starts making a lot more sense. University of Iowa, uh, Boys Town Institute, um, uh, Chapel Hill, N University of North Carolina, us, uh, the group at Stanford, who else do I know? Uh, I'm pretty sure they do at Harvard because my old classmate is head of audiology there. I'm sure she took it with her. Uh, those, those are the ones I'm sure use SII, but it's, it's not widely accepted, but it's, it's a good idea, I think. So our next topic is measuring hearing aids. Um, there is a way to do that. Dr. Levitt talked about real ear aided measures, um, and I'm gonna talk about what that is. Um, this is our old machine that we have. It was called the RM500, um, and it tests what the hearing aid is doing inside your ear compared to your hearing loss. Here is our newest uh, um, real ear measurement called the Axiom. There is another one called the Verifit and with the Oracle. The Oracle. Uh, we use the Verifit and the Axiom in our office. And the Axiom looks like that. And it goes into your ear. There is a probe tube that goes inside your ear. And you can see the arrow pointing to it. And that is basically the microphone that's going in your ear. Then the hearing aid goes on over it, and then a little noise plays out on the speaker, and the microphone that's in the ear is reading what the hearing aid is sending into your ear compared to your hearing loss. And then it prints out a screen like this. Um, I have the person's hearing loss entered in already, and then the dash line that you see there above um, the red line is the target line that we're trying to achieve. And the squiggly green um, line is what the hearing aid doing for that user. This user has a full correction and is, um, is uh, uh, helping this person at the ability that it can do. It's giving them a full correction with their hearing uh, for their hearing loss. Then the same thing on the left ear, the blue is the hearing loss on the left, and the squiggly line is what the hearing aid is doing for you. That's what you want to see when you go to a clinic to get hearing aids. You want to make sure that they're doing real ear, and you have proof that it's actually doing what you want it to do. Because it's, it's hard to just go, oh, you know, I, I can hear you. It's better than what I had before. Um, there's nothing you can really compare it to. The next is we do a test called Quick Speech and Noise or Quick Sin. What this test is, it is this more realistic um, way of showing how you do in noisy situations. There is some background noise of playing in the room, and then a woman's voice comes on and says a sentence. And this background noise gets louder and louder and louder, and we ask you to repeat the sentence, uh, and it changes each time, and it's completely random, it's unrelevant to the sentence before it, and we want to see at what point you can no longer repeat that sentence. And I think it plays on the next. Um, and there was a study done. Um, what year was this? Oh boy, you're gonna quiz me on that. Uh, 2007. <laughs> I just had to find it. 
back in 2007, there was a uh, study done, and they wanted to know what um, what speech test was best for you. Um, there is something called the BKB SIN, the hint test. Both of those are in quiet, correct? They're just a sentence. They're they're in noise, but they're a male voice, and the sentences are pretty short and pretty easy. And what they discovered is they have a ceiling value. It'd be like saying, we're going to do a physical fitness test here today. I anyone who can do one push-up is physically fit. It's not very hard to achieve that. But, and that's kind of the you know, how the hint and the and the and the BKB sin are they're too easy so you can score normally on those without really hearing very well mm -hmm. and that's not what we want we want a test that has no ceiling whatsoever meaning that even normal hearing people we can't do the quick speech and noise test and get a hundred percent I can now because I memorize the words after all these years but not not because I can hear them <laughs> um, and then the other one is the the win test um, and the quick sin. And they came, the, the conclusion was the quick sin and the wind materials are more sensitive measures of recognition performance in background noise than the BK BSIN, BK BSIN and the hint test. Um, so it's more realistic. You got to think uh, if you're in a noisy restaurant, you're probably having a harder time understanding women. If they have the high pitch uh, uh, speech um, and it's more difficult to understand them. So this is more realistic. Uh, so here's what it sounds like. A white silk jacket goes with any shoes. The child crawled into the dense grass. Footprints showed the path he took up the beach. A vent near the edge brought in fresh air. It is a band of steel three inches wide. Yeah, see, even normal hearing people can't score 100% on this. There is no ceiling to this test. And that last one is very difficult. It's where the speech that you're trying to hear and the background noise is exactly even. So it's a very difficult one. <laughs> this is where the lip reading comes in. <laughs> exactly. That's where my lip reading would come into play. <laughs> yep. So... Does it relate to real world listening, Nikki? Uh, the unaided and aided signal to noise ra ratio uh, loss on the quick sin and test provided the best predictors to hearing aid success in daily living in the real world. Okay, so the quick sin test is the best predictor of hearing aid success in the real world. What about user self report? <laughs> Ashley? Well, I think I was chosen for this topic because I'm in the room when we do hearing tests and the first part of a hearing test is we start asking you guys questions about where you're experiencing problems um, if you even have a problem. My favorite is to hear I'm here because my spouse told me to come here. That we get more often than anything or we get I don't have a problem. And I understand because sometimes people mumble. aren't, yeah, people mumble. It's the other person's fault. Um, or you're not in situations with background noise. You're sitting at home, which is fine. I like to sit at home too. Um, but you, you're not in a situation, you're not at a noisy restaurant. You don't know what you're missing. And those people, I'd say, gosh, 70% of the time have a mild to moderate, sometimes even severe hearing loss. Um, so I think that goes to say how uh, reliable user self-report actually is. Um, uh, on the screen here are a couple of surveys that we used to have. Actually, I think they were widely used um, at audiology clinics to measure people's hearing loss and how they thought they were doing. 
I can say that I've never seen these because we stopped using them before I came to the clinic because they have no correlation to the patient's actual hearing loss. Um, so just thinking about what Nikki said earlier, it takes about 10 years for people to show up somewhere and say, I have a problem. Mostly, uh, probably the wife or the husband nagging of going in <laughs> to go yeah. get, it, get it tested. It usually takes about that long. I often hear, oh, I've only been experiencing problems the last six months. That was yesterday or the day before. And, and then this. she says to me, can that much hearing loss show up in six months? And I say, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, user self-report um, is unreliable. We shouldn't be relying on that. Um, so if, if you do notice that you have a problem, your problem's probably worse than you think it was, and you've probably been experiencing it longer than you think you have. And the reason so right. for that is your hearing loss goes slowly and gradually, so it just progresses over time that you just don't notice it. I think it would take waking up one day and you can't hear anything for someone to really come in when the problem actually happened. Yeah. Brings me to the woo method, which is not in the book. This guy, interesting, he's at the University of Iowa. He took 20 people and had them do the most incredible thing. He sent them out with recorders to record their actual listening environments every day and make notes as to what they were doing at the time when they made the recordings. And then he brought them back in and he computed how much noise there actually was in their life. You know, we say, are you in noisy places very often and you say well you know some but some doesn't really cue me in but this guy actually got numbers and what he found well and again self user report <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go uh, he found that about 70% of the time you're in pretty noisy places if you're like these people at India University of Iowa about 70% of the time you're in noisy places really noisy places in fact the numbers were between 0 and 14 meaning that the noise was either either equally as loud as the speech you were trying to hear or it was just a little bit louder than the speech you were trying to hear. So if you're around noise that much every day, you better have a measure of your ability to function in noise, which is what the speech and noise test gives you. And you probably don't have that measure. And if you did, you'd probably need one of these external devices. Do you have yours with you? Mm -hmm. It uh, You can put it on, the, oh, everybody's got theirs. Let me see. <laughs> you clip it to the person you're trying to hear and it takes their voice and puts it right in your ear. I could put this on the back, the person in the back room and have you whisper something and I would hear you. It's amazing. It's, this has been a real lifesaver in, in really noisy situations. I use it in the car when I'm on the highway, clip it onto someone and it'll stream their uh, voice independent of all that road noise. I know that's one of the most difficult places. Now, Russ, you may not know this, but your hearing aid tells on you. Uh, yes, I ad know that. Advanced hearing aids, <laughs> when, we, when we get them on the program, or tell us what you've been doing with them. Right. And I asked Russ to be here. One of the reasons is that he is the largest user of that external mic of all patients we have in our clinic. Right. I'd just like to say for it, you know, you can consider it uh, to be an accessory to your tool, the tool being your hearing aids, and uh, it, it greatly gives you extra abilities to do that just, for example, listening, my listening to somebody here when we are not on this system, I won't hear you as nearly as well as I would if I had this pinned on you. And uh, so the if, I think that the thing that you need to know is that it gives you the sensation of having a headphones on. Uh, it puts it distinctly right at your eardrum. And so that, uh, just like, a, a, like headphones do, they, it makes a very big difference in the audibility. So when, for example, like riding in a car, like Nikki me mentioned, uh, so you're, you're driving along and you're trying to listen to uh, your, whoever is in the car with you, and, and you're wearing hearing aids, and, you, and your hearing aids are programmed right, and you can, and you can hear pretty, pretty 
well, but still with the with the other noise going on, you you're kind of straining a little bit. You, you know, you're kind of going like that. And you're trying to make sure you hear everything just right. When you have that pinned on, you're you're relaxed and you can hear absolutely right on. It makes a terrific difference. It takes a lot of strain off of both of you and the other person that's with you. And the other thing that's really I I use it a lot. Uh, uh, for example, like uh, watching your television. Uh, it will, you can hook that into where the microphone outlet is in your, uh, your, your television system, and the result is the same. You put this, it puts the sound right at your eardrums, and you can hear ever so much. Uh, the audibility is tr dramatically different. I even, I even go so far as to go ahead and put the closed caption on. And what's very nice about that is I, f I find out between the use of this and the closed caption, I get some real idea of what normal hearing is is <laughs> supposed to be because I'm seeing, okay. and I can I can make a comparison. And it's pretty interesting also on that very same subject matter. It's also interesting to see like on a, say a movie or something and there's some audibility that is not here audible to anybody except those that were that had the script so they they write it in and and you find out that there's words that other people that have normal hearing they didn't they couldn't hear it either and and so it's a marvelous absolutely helpful thing to have. And on average, when I, I, I'm right now looking through the data logging is what it's called on, on people's hearing aids, um, to see on average how often they're using this. And it's anywhere from 0% to 5%. And you, Russ, you, you're you're the, the gold. <laughs> yeah, I'm the gold. <laughs> you're at the top of the pi pile. Yeah, I use, I, you're, I, you're around, I think it was 25% of the time you're using that yeah, microphone. Yeah, and Susan likes it a whole bunch. It really has helped her life too. You had a question. How does it pick up the person next to you? Say if Nikki's wearing it, how well would it pick up your voice? So if we were in a noisy restaurant um, and I had three other people with me, I would put uh, my fiance on my right ear because that's my better ear. And then I would clip it on to probably uh, the female talker um, and it would stream her voice as well as her husband. Um, it would pick up that voice as well. It just won't be as strong as the, the person that it's clipped to, but I'll still be able to hear really well. So let me just say on on this this controls the volume on my device here. Okay, so when I'm in a, in a in a restaurant, and and it very I can't I can't stand the, all that all that noise. So I put this on, like if I'm out with my wife Susan, I'll put this on Susan, and I'll run this one. This 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 one here is for the sound coming around here and this one will be my mini mic here so if when I'm sitting there with Susan and and I just want to be able to hear Susan I can run that down a little bit which takes all that terrible racket down and I and I'll put that one up and I can hear her fine and then when when the waitress comes around or waiter and ask some question and I've got this down here I, I, I won't hear that person I can run that back up again and then I'm able to function okay so that is Russ's iPhone um, these hearing aids only work with iPhones so if you don't have an iPhone um, you don't have those controls uh, you can't stream your uh, phone to your hearing aids um, most if not all medical devices these days work with iPhones so if you have a flip phone it's not going to work with that. I'm sorry. My mom has one. I understand. They're uh, simple. They still exist. They still exist, but um, it is only an iPhone. But it is handy because not only will it, that work with the multi-mic, which is what they're describing, but it can stream phone calls directly to your hearing aids. It's like the world's smallest Bluetooth system, and that's why Nikki and Russ don't have trouble on the telephone, and they don't have to wear a device around their neck. Um, that intermediary 
device uh, to stream. So just know that that is a cell phone that he's showing you. Uh, I thought I'd point that out. If based on our measurement of your signal to noise ratio loss from the quick speech and noise test, if you can't score 12 or better, then you're going to really probably need one of those microphones because we know from Dr. Wu's work that that is a typical listening situation 70% of the time for his patients. Discovery of hearing loss in the brain, we've talked about some, and we've also talked about Dr. Sharma's work, but there's one, uh-huh. So, what about um, Android phones? Android phones will do some of these features, but they won't do the phone. Yeah, it'll do uh, the Android, as long as you have a Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy 5, you'll be able to do the remote control feature, but it won't be able to stream audio or uh, the phone call directly to your hearing aids like the iPhone will. Um, so if you want the most for your money, I would just switch over to iPhone. Uh, that way then you can get all the features. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to say that the, what you just mentioned about a, a phone call, uh, being able to do that with a, with a phone when uh, my phone rings and I answer my phone uh, and the, and you're calling me, you're right there in my right in my ear and I can hear really well. Man, boy, I highly recommend it folks. In fact, it we were really at a, makes a transformative difference. We were at a conference and it was a really loud conference. It was so loud in there. Ron was trying to make reservations on his phone and he's like, I, I gotta get somewhere quiet and I'm like, Ron, get, give me your phone. Let let me let me uh let me do this for you. And he's looking at me like you're you're deaf. You can't do this. <laughs> so I got onto his phone and I muted my hearing aids. That way then I couldn't hear all the background noise. All I could hear was the person on the phone. Now they had a little bit of trouble hearing me because it was really loud. So I was shouting into the phone. Uh, but um, I could hear better than Ron, who I know has normal hearing. <laughs> I want to say one word about Raymond Hurley because he's in the book and he did something in 99 that is still very important. He discovered that the unaided ear of people who had only one hearing aid but equal hearing loss was degrading more rapidly. And that was some dramatic proof that auditory reserve is use it or lose it. And as I mentioned we're trying to figure out why people score normally on this speech and noise test. The three variables that seem to keep cropping up is they started early in this search for better hearing. They didn't wait the typical 10 years to get their hearing aids. They secondly had a really good full correction to their hearing loss and the brand and model as we said before had nothing to do with it. It was all in the programming. Uh, so do it now is the moral of that story. Where do you start? Uh, talk to your physician because with a physician referral, Medicare will pay for your hearing test. See us next and we will send you to an ear, we'll do a variety of tests and we'll send you to an ear specialist if you need medical intervention and a shocking number of you do. Next. Uh, reliability has more to do with the type of hearing aid than the brand. Uh, the things that go deep down in your ear break down way more than the type that have all the electronics behind your ear. Next. By features, the more things you hang on the hearing aid, like a thing around your neck, the more problems you're going to have. The fewer devices that it takes to make your hearing aids work, the more reliability you'll have because those extra pieces break down. By brand, I don't think there's a huge difference, to tell you the truth, as long as you... As long uh, as they're programmed properly, you're going to do just as well with any of the big six uh, manufacturers, as long as it's programmed properly. Comfort-wise... Uh, the things that plug up your ear are less comfortable. So the smallest of them, oddly enough, are, tends to be the least comfortable. The ones that have very little in your ear are the more comfortable. And the more it stops up your ear, the more you're going to have that head in a barrel experience. So try to avoid that. Additional features, there's a whole bunch of them, but the ones that we're particularly interested in are beam forming hearing aids that zero in on the thing you want to hear. Oddly enough, people don't like it much. Nikki said it made her seem more deaf, like when she was a little girl. Yeah, because all the speech was focused here and it shut off all the background noise. Someone came up behind me. I did not hear them coming, and I do not like that. I want to be able to hear everything around me. It made me feel like I had my uh, hearing aid on from 20 years ago, where I could not hear very well with that hearing aid. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the additional features, we talked about the microphone. Um, uh, it streams the person's voice directly to, to my hearing aid, or I can plug it into a TV, CD player, laptop, and it'll stream the audio source directly to my hearing aid. Uh, the other additional feature is user-controlled uh, noise reduction. And which, Russ explained that. Mm -hmm, which Russ explained that. I can tune out the background noise uh, compared to the speech that I want to hear. Uh, rechargeable batteries. Um, I'm wearing this now. Uh, it's called the Lynx 3D with the Z-Power kit. I uh, just plug my hearing aid in at night, and it will uh, charge my hearing aids, and it lasts for 16 hours, as long as I'm not doing heavy streaming, like the iPhone phone calls or the microphone device. Um, and you want to just make sure that you charge it every single night to uh, keep the batteries fresh and the hearing aids yeah, in working order. The next one is one brand really better. We we address that. We address that. And what's next? What we want to uh, see next is waterproof hearing aids and three-year warranty against failure from sweat. Um, most uh, hearing aids, the top of the line hearing aids, do have a three-year repair and loss damage warranty. But we want to see waterproof hearing aids now. Uh, Resound bought up a company. Um, it's uh, Jabra. Jabra. And it uh, is a wireless um, a Bluetooth headset for normal hearing people, and it's completely waterproof. And it keeps track of my heart rate and my oxygenation level. Mm -hmm. And I think your hearing aids shouldn't be so limited anymore. I think th they bought that company for a purpose. Yeah. Uh, I think the next so, think round of Resound hearing aids are going to be doing that. I think the next step is that you'll be able to see how loud, um, what environment you're in. Yes. Uh, I would love to see the hearing aid. You, you walk out with the hearing aid, and the next week I see you, I can see a little report, a little data. Hey, this user was in uh, really loud uh, noises, restaurant-type places 30% uh, of the time versus in quiet. It would be really nice to be able to see uh, yeah, what you type and, of environment you and Zuckerberg, in. right? Sure. <laughs> well, the other thing I you're would saying like Wu is doing it at University of Indy, Iowa, and uh, I'm sure he is looking towards doing this. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I would like to see not only just iPhone use, but uh, Androids, all Androids out there, because um, it would be really nice to not limit you guys on your phone choices. Because I know there are some phones better than that are better than others. I would also like to see I currently have the iWatch the Apple Watch and um, I can control my hearing aid with the watch as long as my phone is within 15 to 20 feet I can take phone calls on my watch as long as my phone is within 15 to 20 feet, it'll go to my hearing aid. Uh, I can't go on a walk and leave my phone and have the um, the watch stream to my hearing aid. Right now, I can still take the phone call without my phone nearby, but it'll come out of the watch uh, um, speaker instead of my hearing aid. So I'm looking forward to them putting that little antenna or whatever they need inside here like they have in the iPhone. Uh, that way, I, I can do that.